Hello, my name is Father Nolan Lowry. I am the pastor, the priest of St. Edward's Catholic Church here in Athens. And I will be reading pages 157 through 179. Julia opens the metal box. I see a row of little squares, green, blue, red, black, yellow, purple, orange. The colors seem to glow. She pulls out a brush with a thin tuft of a tail at its end. She dips the brush in water and wets the paper, then taps at the red square. When the brush meets the damp paper, pink petals of color unfurl like morning flowers. I can't take my eyes off that magical brush. For a moment, I'm not thinking about Ruby and Mac and the claw stick and Stella. Almost. Julia touches red again, then blue, and there suddenly is the purple of a ripe grape. She touches the blue, and her paper turns to summer sky, black and white, and now I see that she is painting a picture of Ruby. I can make out her floppy ears, her thick legs. Julia stops painting. She takes a few steps back, hands on her hips, gazing at her work. She scowls. It's not right, she says. She glances over her shoulder at me. I try to look encouraging. Julia starts to crumple up the paper, then reconsiders. Instead, she slides it into my cage at the spot where my glass is broken. Here you go, she says. A Julia original. That'll be worth millions someday. Gingerly, I pick up the paper. I do not eat a single bite of it. Oh, hey, I almost forgot. Julia runs to her backpack. She pulls out three plastic jars, one yellow, one blue, one red. She opens the jars, and an odd not food smell hits my nose. Julia pushes the jars one by one through the opening. Then she slides some paper through. These are called finger paints, she says. My aunt gave them to me, but really I'm too old for finger painting. I stick a finger into the red jar. The paint is thick as mud. It's cool and smooth like bananas underfoot. I pop my finger into my mouth. It's not exactly ripe mango, but it's not bad. Julia laughs. You don't eat it. You paint with it. She grabs a piece of paper and presses her finger on it. See, like this. I place my finger on a piece of paper. I lift it, and a red mark is there. I get a bigger glob from the pot and slap my hand down on the page. When I pull my hand off the paper, its red twin stays behind. This isn't like the ghostly handprints on my glass, the ones my visitors leave behind. This handprint can't be so easily wiped away. A Bad Dream I lie awake peeling dried paint off my fingertips. Bob, who accidentally walked on one of my paintings, is licking his red paws. Every so often I glance over at the empty ring. The claw stick glints in the moonlight. Stop! No! Ruby's frantic cries startle me. Ruby, I call. You're having a bad dream. You're okay. You're safe. Where's Stella? She says, gulping air. Before I can answer, she says, Never mind. I remember now. Go back to sleep, Ruby, I say. You've had a hard day. I can't go back to sleep, she says. I'm afraid I'll have the same dream. There was a sharp stick and it hurt. I look at Bob and he looks back at me. Oh, Ruby says. Oh, Mac. She puts her trunk between the bars. Do you think, she hesitates, do you think Mac is mad because I hurt him today? I consider lying, but gorillas are terrible liars. Probably, I finally say. He ran away after that, Ruby says. Bob gives a scornful laugh. Crawled away is more like it. We are quiet for a while. Branches claw at the roof. A light rain drums. One of the parrots murmurs something in her sleep. Ruby breaks a silence. Ivan? I smell something funny. He can't help it, Bob says. I believe she's referring to the finger paints Julia gave me, I say. What fing are finger paints? Ruby asks. 
You make pictures with them, I explain. Could you make a picture of me? Maybe someday. I remember Julia's picture, the one that will be worth a million dollars. I hold it up to the glass. Look, it's you. Julia made it. It's hard to see, Ruby says. There's not much moonlight. Why do I have two trunks? I examine the picture. Those are feet. Why do I have two feet? That's called artistic license, Bob says. Ruby sighs. Could you tell me another story, she asks. I don't think I can ever go back to sleep. I told you all I remember, I say with a helpless shrug. Then tell me a new story, she says. Make something up. I try to think, but my thoughts keep returning to Mac and his claw stick. Anything yet? Ruby asks. I'm working on it. Ivan? Ruby presses. Bob said you are going to save me. I... I search for true words. I'm working on that, too. Ivan, Ruby says in a voice so low I can barely hear her. I have another question. I can tell from the sound of her voice that this will be a question I don't want to answer. Ruby taps her trunk against the rusty iron bars of her door. Do you think, she asks, that I'll die in this domain someday, like Aunt Stella? Once again, I consider lying. But when I look at Ruby, the half-formed words die in my throat. Not if I can help it, I said instead. I feel something tighten in my chest, something dark and hot. And it's not a domain, I add. I pause, and then I say it. It's a cage. The Story I look at the ring, layered with fresh sawdust. I look at the skylight and the half-hidden moon. I just thought of a story, I say. Is it a made-up story or a true one? Ruby asks. True, I say. I hope. Ruby leans against the bars. Her eyes hold the pale moon in them, the way a still pond holds stars. Once upon a time, I say, there was a baby elephant. She was smart and brave, and she needed to go to a place called a zoo. What's a zoo? Ruby asks. A zoo, Ruby, is a place where humans make amends. A good zoo is a place where humans care for animals and keep them safe. Did the baby elephant get to the zoo? Ruby asks softly. I don't answer right away. Yes, I say at last. How did she get there? Ruby asks. She had a friend, I say. A friend who made a promise. How? It takes a long time, but finally Ruby returns to sleep. Ivan, Bob whispers, yawning. What you said about the zoo, how are you going to do it? Suddenly I feel as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something. Bob says confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't? I ask, but Bob is already asleep. His little red feet dance, and I know he's running in his dreams. Remembering. Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made to Stella, and the pictures I've made for Ruby. And I remember. I remember it all. What they did. We were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Something to buy. There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there. It is made from the hand of a gorilla. Another Ivan. When morning comes and the parking lot glimmers with dew, I see the billboard on the highway. There I am, the one and only Ivan, bathed in the pink light of dawn. I look so angry with my furrowed brow and clenched fists. I look the way my father did the day the men came. I am, I suppose, a peaceful sort. Mostly I watch the world go by and think about naps and bananas and yogurt raisins. But inside me hidden is another Ivan. He could tear a grown man's limbs off his body. In the flicker of time, it takes a snake's tongue to taste the air. He could taste revenge. He is the Ivan on the billboard. 
I stare at the one and only Ivan and the faded picture of Stella, and I remember George and Mac on their ladders, adding the picture of Ruby to bring new visitors to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. I remember the story Ruby told, the one where the villagers came to her rescue. I hear Stella's kind, wise voice. Humans can surprise you sometimes. I look at my fingers coated in red paint, color of blood, and I know how to keep my promise. Days. During the days I wait. During the nights I paint. I worry when Mac takes Ruby into the ring. He carries the claw stick with him at all time now. He doesn't use it. He doesn't have to. Ruby isn't fighting back anymore. She does whatever Mac asks. Nights. I close my eyes. I dip my finger into the paint. When I'm done with one piece of paper, I set it aside to dry. It's so small, just one sheet, and I'm going to need so many. I move on to the next and the next and the next. It's a giant puzzle, and I'm making the pieces one by one. By morning, my floor is covered with paintings. I hide the paintings under my pool of dirty water before Mac can see them. I don't want them to end up in the gift store, selling for $20 a piece. 25 with frame. These paintings are for Ruby. Every one of them. Project. Ivan, Ruby asks one morning when I'm trying to nap, why are you always sleepy during the day? I've been working on a project at night, I tell her. What's a project? It's a thing. A painting. It's a painting for you, actually, I answer. Ruby looks pleased. Can I see it? Not yet. Ruby pokes with annoyance at her roped foot. She takes a breath. Ivan, do I have to do the shows with Mac today? I'm afraid so. I'm sorry, Ruby. Ruby dips her trunk in her water bucket. That's okay, she says. I already knew the answer. Not right. It's night again and everyone's asleep. I look at the picture I've just made, one of the dozens. It's smudged and torn, a muddy blur. I place it beside the others lining up my door. The colors are wrong. The shapes are off. It looks like nothing. It's not what I'm trying to create. It's not what it's meant to be. It's not right, and I don't know why. Across the parking lot to the billboard beckons, as it always does. Come to the exit 8, Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and the only. Ivan, mighty silverback. If I could use human words to say what I need to say, this would all be so easy. Instead, I have my pots of paint and my ragged pages. I sigh. My fingertips glow like jungle flowers. I try again.